Prior to 1922, the American film industry was pretty free with portraying sexuality and violence in movies. Moral and religious critics became more and more vocal about the need for stricter controls over what could and could not be seen in the films that American citizens, primarily impressionable American youths, were going to see. In 1921, famous screen actor Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was accused of the rape and death of up-and-coming Hollywood starlet Virginia Rappé. The resulting trial ignited a media storm that renewed the cry for censorship. Rather than face the possibility of government censorship, the big three, Motion Picture Studios, Metro Goldwyn, Famous Players Lasky, which later became Paramount Pictures, and First National, which later merged with Warner Brothers, instead created the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America as the new watchdog group and hired former U.S. Postmaster General Will Hayes to head the operation. Will Hayes was responsible for instituting the Motion Picture Production Code, which would also be called the Hayes Code, as a standard for moral content in American film. The code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. It states the considerations which good taste and community value make necessary in this universal form of entertainment. Respect for law. Respect for every religion, respect for every race, and respect for every nation. The Hayes Code outright banned some things and strongly suggested other things be avoided. Among the outright banned materials were ridicule of the clergy, illegal drug trafficking, profanity, nudity, mention or inference of unconventional sex acts, sexual relationships between whites and blacks, and the display of children's sex organs. The code's kind suggestions of avoidance included the explicit depictions of crime, seduction, and the use of drugs or alcohol. Oh. Oh. Do it again! I like it! Do it again! The Hayes Code didn't truly come into play until around 1930, but due to the fragile economy of the Great Depression, Hollywood opted to flout the code and continued producing the types of films that made money at the box office which just happened to be the types of films that the code was entirely against. This period, between 1930 and 1934, became known as the Pre-Code Era. In 1934, however, an amendment to the code was adopted that established the Production Code Administration and required all motion pictures to obtain a certificate of approval from the PCA before the film would be allowed to be released. If Hollywood wanted to make money, then they would have to play by the rules of the MPPDA and the PCA. In 1945, the MPPDA changed its name to the Motion Picture Association of America, or the MPAA. Hollywood played nice with the MPAA and the PCA until the late 1950s when the rise of television and the competitive threat of foreign cinemas began encroaching on their profits. A TV set to match your furniture. Look here. Instant power tuning, just a touch to change channels. And complete wireless remote director, too. With the invention of television, people no longer had to leave their homes and pay ticket prices. The U.S. courts also found in the late 50s that the big Hollywood studios violated antitrust laws, which opened the doors to independent studios and allowed foreign films, which were not bound by the code, to be seen on American movie screens. In 1966, Jack Valenti, a former assistant to President Lyndon Johnson, took over as head of the MPAA and served as president until 2011. By the late 1960s, the code was all but unenforceable. In the light of progressive movements like the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Rights Movement, censorship became seen as outdated. Rather than openly censoring films that were coming out of Hollywood, the MPAA created a rating system that defined the types of content that parents could expect to see in a given film, so they could make an informed decision as to whether or not their children should see the film. I'm Chuck Heston. I'd like to talk to you for a minute about something I think you'll feel is worth talking about especially if you're the parents of younger children. But let me explain to you what the different ratings mean. A G rating on a picture means that it doesn't contain any material which most parents would find unsuitable for their children. But a PG rating on a picture is a special alert for parents. That means that the film contains some material which you, as a parent, may possibly find unsuitable for your children. Your concern may be violence or language or sensuality or even the overall theme of the picture. Now, an R-rated picture definitely contains adult material. That's why children 16 years old or younger are barred, unless they're accompanied by a parent 
Again, you have to decide whether you want your children to see such a film under those conditions. The X rating, of course, is reserved for films that are totally adult in content. No one under 17 can enter a theater showing an X-rated film. And in some cities and states, the age requirement can be even higher. Well, that's the rating system. The PG-13 rating wasn't invented until the mid-80s, when violence in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Gremlins prompted director Steven Spielberg to lobby Jack Valenti and the MPAA for an intermediary rating that bridged the gap between PG and NC-17. Although the rating system is a great way for parents to quickly assess the appropriateness of a given film in regard to their children, the arbitrary and unbalanced way the films are rated creates a disparity amongst the films that could cause some confusion. While some films are rated R for certain content, other films are rated NC-17 for having very similar content. One example is how the MPA Ratings Board assigns ratings for sexual content. If a film depicts heterosexual sex acts, it is likely to receive an R rating, while if a film depicts homosexual sex acts, it is likely to be slapped with an NC-17. You know, if it's the same gender sex, they seem to often have a bigger problem uh, than they do if it's a man and a woman. You are soft and cuddly. But if you're of the majority, you know, then it's a lot easier to, to get the good rating and show your movie in a theater. So why the disparity? The MPAA Ratings Board is comprised of conservative Christian members who act as the moral police of American cinema. If a scene or theme doesn't conform to the Christian ideal of morality, then the Ratings Board labels the film unsuitable for a broad audience and gives it an NC-17 rating. Without their blessing in the form of an acceptable rating, a film cannot be released, and although an NC-17 is still an acceptable rating, it severely limits the audience demographic and reduces the box office money that the film is capable of attaining. The majority of cinemas in America will not play movies that are unrated by the MPAA. No rating means no showing, which means no money. Good morning, I'm Cindy Schroyer. On today's Does It Really Matter? We look at the problem of movie theaters enforcing the Motion Picture Association of America's film rating system. Young people have pushed those rating boundaries for decades, sneaking in to see an R-rated movie when mom and dad have told them they're not allowed. But can the theater really keep those young people from going to see the movie. After all, the ratings are intended to inform parents about a film's contact, content, but do they hold any water? We called local theaters in Cheyenne, Wyoming, a city with two major movie theaters and one for second-run films, to see what happens when a youth attempts to enter a film that they're not old enough to see by virtue of the film's rating. One manager spoke briefly to us, but refused to be on camera. How do you enforce the rating system? Yeah, we don't like kids in if they're not supposed to see the movie. How do you keep them from entering the theater? We just don't let them in. <laughs> do you check IDs before selling tickets? Um. What is done if they're caught watching a movie that the rating says they're not old enough for? Well, we, um, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> the two other theaters, both run by the same owner, declined to make any comment. As the MPA ratings carry no force of law, be it local, state, or national, we spoke with local law enforcement to see how officers handle these situations. A public information officer revealed the situation is a domestic issue, dealt with if a parent calls the police for assistance. Such an issue falls under unruly juvenile status, statutes, which carries some legal weight if combined with the history of illegal juvenile action, but not simply because Susie or Johnny went to a movie without mom's consent. So, does it really matter if we have a movie, rate, movie rating system? Some people may say yes, due to the need for people to know what the content, content is. But from a legal standpoint, there just is no point. Thank you for joining us for another Does It Really Matter? So, if there is no substantial weight behind the enforcing of the movie ratings, what purpose do they really serve other than to act as guidelines for moral censorship? Webster's Dictionary defines censorship as the examination in order to suppress or delete anything considered objectionable. 
Although the MPAA Ratings Board does not censor films themselves, they do force filmmakers to cut scenes or materials deemed unacceptable by the Ratings Board. If the Ratings Board was making these decisions while representing an accurate cross-section of American families, it would be one thing. However, the Ratings Board only allows for the slanted judgment of the ultra-conservative. How do we fix this broken system? Instead of operating under a shroud of secrecy, the board should be out in the open. We vote for the politicians that guide our moral direction as a nation. Why then is the moral fiber of our entertainment at the whim and mercy of a faceless and untouchable shadow organization with no oversight or culpability? If the system was open to and designed around traditional family values and non-traditional family values, rather than a one-sided religious moral perspective, then the decisions of the board could be seen as fair and to the entirety of the movie-going public. As the system is now, the board just institutes their ratings without any information or direction as to how to fix the issues that earn the film an unfavorable rating. By instituting a set standard for each rating, the board could eliminate a lot of the guesswork involved in the filmmaking process, making it easier for directors to adhere to the guidelines of the rating. A standardized set of rules for each rating would also give parents the comfort of knowing exactly what is in the film without the worry of the inconsistencies engendered in the current unbalanced rating system. While none of us will argue against the need for a rating system, we can argue for a system that is fair and open, and that encompasses a broader spectrum of ideals and not just the ideals of one group of Americans. People of all ages and walks of life attend movies every day, and while it is great that parents have a system for gauging the appropriateness of a film for their children, that system should not infringe upon the rights of the rest of us that do not subscribe to that exact moral standards of that one group.